All right, folks, you guys hear me in the back okay? Great. Uh, okay, I thought, I thought this would be a good one to start with. My mind is made up, don't confuse me with the facts. We're gonna, I'm gonna throw a lot of data at you today. A lot, a lot more than the last lectures. Uh, and I'm gonna implore you to keep your mind very open. Um, all I'm gonna share is data. I'm gonna share my opinion on that data as well. Uh, but this is a very emotional topic for, for many people, for many of us. Uh, so be patient and charitable with me. <clears throat> All right, welcome to the series. Uh, who who uh, was here last time? Raise your hand. Fantastic. Who has never been to any of these lectures before? Raise your hand. Okay, so it's mostly our group. And you new guys are okay too, I guess. All right. <laughs> Um, okay, so you know President McConkie, you know me, and we are now going to talk about the great wedge issue, LGBTQ+, theology, policy, and sociology related to sexual minorities in the church. So, uh, yeah, we're going to try to harmonize LGBTQ uh, fundamentals with the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, based on the data that we have. So, um, this is kind of the dichotomy that I think is really familiar with a lot of people, uh, especially sexual minorities. But this really applies to all of us. Um, on the mercy side, we might think God created me this way and loves me exactly the way I am. On the justice side, we might think I'm broken and until I'm fixed, I will never be worthy. Now, neither of these statements are good and true. Neither of these statements are justice or mercy. So I think that's maybe a first step in understanding, uh, well, frankly, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it can certainly be well applied to the topic of sexual minorities in, in the church. I thought I'd start with this concept of justice and mercy and help calibrate us. Um, this is a more humorous way to do it. I think this is kind of funny. Uh, this is from a TV show. Our religion is based on love, Sheldon, not fear. Well, so what happens when people don't follow the rules? They burn in hell. <laughs> so. I don't know if that would play as well at Protestant churches, but. <laughs> we, <laughs> all right. So what is a sexual minority? About 4% of Latter-day Saints in the U.S., uh, identify as sexual minorities. Um, so this is interesting in, within the context of Latter-day Saints. This is significantly lower than the non-Latter-day Saint population in the U.S. This is recent data from the 2023 B.H. Roberts uh, National Survey. So it's fresh data. It's a snapshot taken uh, from 2023. About 4%. So what is LGBTQ plus mean? Well, L is lesbian, G is gay, bisexual, transgender, queer or questioning, and plus is everything else. So there are lots of different acronyms, acronyms or acronyms rather, uh, and, but this is probably one of the most common ones to use. Um, speaking of terminology, I'm just gonna go through some quick terminology here. Again, it, you know, depending on what generation you are or who your friends and family are, you, this may be new to you. Other people might be like, yeah, I already know all this, but I, I think it's important. So instead of saying homosexual or queer, try saying gay, lesbian, or queer. No, notice queer is twice. Queer historically was a pejorative. Now it's perfectly okay to say um, if you put it in the correct, correct context. So queer is a fine term to use, um, and, it, and it can mean lot. It can be gay or lesbian or transgender. It's just sort of an umbrella term. Homosexual, you think, well, what's wrong with that? Used in a clinical context, it's acceptable. But just in everyday talk, it's, it's really not something that's acceptable. It's a little hurtful. There's a lot of nuances to this. Semantics are inherently complex. Uh, and they change. If I was giving this 10 years from now, or 30 years ago, this would be a different list. But this is where we are today, okay? Transsexual, not a good term to use. Transgender is the proper term now. Transvestite, we now say cross-dresser. 
Hermaphrodite, intersex is the appropriate term. Biological male or female, we now say assigned female or male at birth. I just want to point out, I do my best, but it's tough, right? I'm 50 years old, and growing up, these were different. So you'll, you'll see me slip. And then a lot of times we'll be talking about uh, academic or clinical work, and I'll shift into a more clinical way of speaking, which sometimes matches this and sometimes doesn't, based on the context. Uh, a lifestyle, an identity, right? Sexual preference, instead sexual orientation. Preference implies choice, orientation doesn't. So we'll talk a lot more about that as well. But again, just wanted to level set uh, on how to speak in 2024 about this topic. Um, also, I want to talk about sex and gender. Again, we're still talking about terms, get the vocab right, right? Gender is how you present yourself, okay? Sex is biological in nature, and sex and gender traditionally are congruent. They were the same things traditionally, now they're not. Not necessarily, anyway, they can be different things. A really simple, over, overly simple, in fact, it's so, so overly simple I might not want to, want to say it, but I will anyway, because I think it's universally understood, like a tomboy, or, or, or you know, that, that's maybe a girl that is biologically a girl, but dresses and acts like a boy. So that you have a gender representation and maybe a biology uh, representation. So again, oversimplified, but you can see that's a very simple example of a difference between sex and gender, okay? All right, let's, uh, just a quick note on intersex. Um, Clinically, they're referred to disorders of sex, sexual development or sex development. Uh, the definition and the prevalence of intersex is actually hotly debated. Uh, it's, it's a point of controversy, even amongst uh, academics and scientists, uh, social scientists. Uh, I think a, a reasonable definition that is widely accepted is that it's defined as chromosomal sex in, inconsistent with your phenotypic sex. Basically, your, your chromosomes don't quite match up how you look. <laughs> Again, oversimplified. Um, the majority of intersex people uh, have physical characteristics that do match with uh, dominant male or female uh, appearance. Uh, there's about 0.02% to 0.05% intersex people, generally speaking. So that's about one in 2,000 or one in 5,000. So there might be one intersex person in our stake, and chances are you wouldn't know. If you saw them, you probably couldn't tell. But I mean, something's not quite right with their chromosomes. And so how that manifests and what type of intersex challenge they have, unless they talk to you about it, you may not know, okay? So these are intersex people. Um, this is a great quote to refer to this, I, I think apply to this. Kindness, compassion, and love are powerful instruments in strengthening us to carry heavy burdens imposed without any fault of our own and to do what we know to be right, President Oaks. So, all right, so this is a little bit about intersex. By the way, this, like I said, is very controversial. There's a common thing you hear, oh, there's as many intersex people as there are people with red hair. That's not true at all. Uh, but if you widen the definition to include people that identify as non-binary, that don't actually have biological or chromosomal issues, you, you, can, you can begin to widen that field. But again, we're talking about biology here. Gay and straight, okay? These are not binary things. You're not, I'm straight or I'm gay, right? It's actually on a spectrum. The spectrum is traditionally called the Kinsey scale. It's developed by Alfred Kinsey, who by all reports was a total creep, uh, but his scale is pretty useful, and so we still use it today. Um, <clears throat> and this, uh, the majority of people are clustered on the heterosexual side, which is zero, so completely heterosexual. If you're like, hey, I'm a dude, but I kind of like Tom Selleck when he wears shorts, maybe, <laughs> maybe that means you're a one or a two on the scale. For example, right? That's none of my business. It's just you do your thing. 
but that's to understand how the Kinsey scale works. All right? And you can see, and this data comes out all the time. This is just one uh, that was done uh, from a YouGov survey, and you can kind of see, uh, by the way, this is done by ages. You see 18 to 29 are significantly higher in a lot of the middle part. Younger people tend to identify, and we'll talk more about that um, in the middle of the scale. So, all right, love. Let's talk about love for just a minute. Traditional definitions of love, philia is friendship or you know, love for family. Agape is like a divine love. And eros is like a passionate or romantic love, okay? And a lot of what we're gonna be talking about is here. When I talk about uh, eros, I'm not talking just about sex, okay? Someone who is gay is not just like, I'm gay, because I only care about sex with men, you know, if they're a guy. It's more than that. It includes romantic relationships and passion and, and a million other things on a spectrum of relationship. Sex is an integral, central part of that. But all of us, when we love each other in a romantic way, it's not just about sex. When we're 18 years old, it might be. But <laughs> anyway, so just a little bit about love, okay? All right, let's start with queer history. We start at the beginning, start way back. Unfortunately, the problem with queer history is, is there's almost none of it, um, at least that we know. Uh, there, in the 20th century and in the 21st century, there's been a trend to queer history, okay? And that means taking what we know about history and reinterpreting it through a queer lens and trying to see if we can discern queer lifestyle styles or writings or philosophy in ancient texts and practices and artifacts. That's really, really hard, okay? Lots of cultures, uh, lots of, uh, uh, have bits and pieces of stuff that we, you know, it's like looking at tea leaves, and people have written a lot about it. Um, the problem is, is we just don't have a lot of historical data on this. Um, where we do have some data is with the Greeks and the Romans. They wrote stuff down, but even, even they didn't write that much down about this. I can tell you there's no Greek or Latin word for homosexual. Homosexual, that didn't exist in ancient times. We don't have any evidence that someone said, I'm gay and you're straight. That just wasn't something anyone ever said, okay? Gay sex was socially acceptable and was typically between adult men and young teenage boys. Pedestry is, is what this is, and that is culturally it was acceptable. Two adult men having sex with each other was a little strange. That was not the norm. Uh, gay sex between adult men existed, like I said, because of social implications. If you were a top, you were dominant. If you were a bottom, something was wrong with you, okay? Uh, in Rome, uh, in fact, you were put to death if you were a soldier and you had gay sex. Unless, again, you were having it with a prisoner and you were on top. Then it was okay. Again, it was a very different way of thinking, all right? Lesbian relationships, we just don't know. Um, there's just, you know, how things were back then. Didn't write a lot about women. There's, there's a few little bits and pieces, um, and a lot of uh, queer writing related to lesbianism in the ancient uh, world. There's lots of text on that. Very few actual primary documents that speak to sexual relationships, okay? So... That's kind of that's all we know. We can look to the Bible, right? Uh, in biblical times, Judeo-Christian tradition, these things on the left were really unacceptable. Okay, the things on the right were okay, right? And if you were here for the polygamy lecture, you see polygyny there and heterosexuality. Now, what happened, though, in modern times, we got rid of polygyny. That's not okay. All these other things became okay. Now, pederasty and, and bestiality and incest are still not okay. Uh, but, but everything else is okay. You know, so we, you know, sexual morality changes. Historically, this change is, is pretty radical. Um, but this is just to orient yourself around that, how morality, sexual morality has changed. What's that? Oh, pederasty, that's, that's when an adult male has a sexual relationship with an adolescent boy, okay? 
Bestiality is when you have sex with an animal. When a man has a sex with like a sheep or a goat or a horse, you know. Uh, and then incest is when you have sex with uh, a, a son or a daughter has sex with a, a mother or father or a sibling. Sorry, I didn't define that. Okay. So for the past 6,000 6, years, sex is something you did. Okay. Now it's something you are. Really huge difference. Has amazing social implications. For example, if you stole something, that's an action. Well, then you're a thief. If you lie, you're a liar. If you had a cigarette, you're a smoker. Okay? Um, of course, being gay, you know, having gay sex just doesn't mean you're gay because it's more complicated than that. But again, I just want you to appreciate for 6,000 years how it was and how it is now. Uh, I'm going to share with you something from uh, a model from Ty Mansfield. He's, he's a faculty member at BYU. And he's a, a social scientist and, and a, a therapist. Um, and uh, it's called The Tears of Sexuality. And I think it's a great model for understanding um, same-sex relationships. Uh, or, or frankly, any, <laughs> any kind of sexual relationship, really. So attraction and aversion, these are experiences. You say, gosh, I'm attracted to this person or this thing. And, and, and that just happens, right? That's a foundational thing that happens. Orientation is something where you're like, you know what? This keeps happening. I'm going to invest in this. I'm going to embrace it. And we're going to just, this is, this is becoming how I act. And these things are complex developmental and environmental issues. And we'll talk a lot more about that. But they're, they're usually unconscious. They just sort of happen. All right? Next, we have behavior. Who you choose to have a relationship with. And then finally, an identity, what you decide to call yourself. These things are conscious decisions. So we have less conscious and more conscious decisions. And you can put a spectrum here on little, like low or no agency here on the bottom, and high agency at the top. So when you think about sexuality, you can decide, OK, how, how is my sexuality built here? What part am I thinking about consciously and making decisions about versus what part are, I've just sort, of, just sort of showed up, you know? Or maybe you can trace it back to your youth and say, well, I can kind of see how this formed this way, right? This is, I think, a useful model, a constructive model. It's a little more complicated, but I think if you want to understand sexuality, this is a useful way to do that in a, in a productive way. So let's get back to queer history, right? We're going to go to Germany, right? In the 19th century, this is where the concept of homosexuality and, frankly, heterosexuality showed up. Um, German psychiatrists and gay activists, there were laws, anti-sodomy laws in Germany. And some people in the late 19th century said, you know what, I don't like this. And um, they basically said, look, uh, and, and that's what they called gay people back then, earnings. Um, We deserve love and, and recognition. And in fact, we should be married. Way back then, they were talking about gay marriage. Now, a few decades before, this was nonsense, because no one knew what a gay person was. There was, again, essentially no such thing as a gay person. It was just, hey, that dude has sex with dudes. And he just does that. But you didn't say that guy's gay. Um, okay. We're going to go through some history really quick here. 1950s. And, and there's so much I'm leaving out. I say this every lecture. Uh, I've spent, prob well, uh, yeah, I know, probably about 1,000 hours studying uh, sexual minority uh, history in the 20th century. So it just killed me not to include <laughs> Uh, the, the fascinating history of the 20th century. But this is something that at the B.H. Roberts Foundation, I personally have spent many, many hundreds of hours over the last four years studying. Um, the Matachin uh, Society started in 1951. This was uh, known as the first gay rights group in America. The American Psychiatric Association published the DSM-1, which basically said, look, uh, We're going to pathologize being gay. If you're gay, that's a type of mental illness, and we need to treat this. 
The British Medical Association called for research in 1955. They said, we need to learn about gay people. Let's start studying this. So they put a general call out for people to start researching this. And the Wolfenden Report, uh, they got tired of prostitutes and gay people in their prisons because if you had gay sex, you got thrown in prison. And the British government's like, we're tired of all these guys in prison. We need to fix this. And so go figure it out. The Wolfenden Report basically said, maybe we should stop throwing them in prison. Uh, maybe we should help them become not gay. So that was the beginning uh, in Britain. In the US, there's not much history. I mean, the Matachin Society, that's French. I think it means stranger or other or hidden person. Does anyone know French? Matachin? Come on, really? <laughs> All right. OK, 1960s. The UK, uh, they started having hospitals start to do uh, gay conversion therapy and uh, psychoanalytical work with gay people trying to help them figure out how to be happy with their life and predominantly to have them become heterosexual. So all that work started in the 60s. Uh, it was all unwanted homosexuality, generally speaking. Um, at the time, there were very few people that were like, I'm gay and I'm stoked on that. Everyone was like, I'm married to a woman and I have five kids and I keep sneaking out at night and having sex in the park and I want to stop. Like that was the typical person that worked with uh, these health facilities. I've read many, 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 many transcripts of interviews and clinical work and that is the typical case. Stonewall riots happened in New York in 1969. So basically the 60s was a bunch of research in Britain and then uh, some Queer people in New York that were at a gay bar uh, were getting arrested by police and they said, you know what, we're tired of being arrested. Screw you guys. And they threw bricks and stones and bottles and they rioted for two or three days. And that became really the mark. It was a big social change in our country because instead of hiding in the shadows, queer people were like, we are, leave us alone. We are doing what we're doing. Just, we're in America. And in America, you can do what you want. And so that was the beginning of that, the Stonewall riots. 1970s, the first gay pride parade happened. Right after 69, you get 70, and, and we have a parade. The Gay Liberation Front started to what they called ZAP, the uh, American uh, Psychiatric Association. They would have conferences every year, and this was a strategy, pretty smart. They said, you know what our biggest problem is? People think we're mentally ill. So we need to, to literally attack and invade the APA and demand that they cure us by changing the manual. So they started to uh, go to these conferences and scream and yell and protest and disrupt them. And after several years, this is, this is kind of a strange photo here. See this guy with the scary mask? That's a, a, a psychiatrist who put a mask on and, and he actually took over the stage, this is in 72 if I remember correctly, and basically said, hi, I'm gay. And I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist, and I'm not crazy. We need to change this. So after a few years, they did. Um, various American universities were experimenting with conversion therapy at this time. We'll talk a little bit more about that. BYU did as well. They came in sort of last. Harvard was kind of in the forefront of this. Uh, and then the APA depathologized homosexuality in 74. Okay. Uh, following that, the American uh, Psychological Association did, and then uh, a few years later, the American Medical Association, and it just sort of the dominoes happened. Okay? Now we're in the 80s, the AIDS crisis. Uh, Gay Olympics started. ACT UP. The, I, I grew up out in the San Francisco Bay Area, so the 80s this is kind of when I grew up. This is all very familiar to me. This, is, this was all around me at the time. Uh, they were the silence equals death folks, a lot of protests. Um, the APA uh, continued, um, and, and by the way, after the 74-75 ruling, pretty much all research into conversion therapy stopped. No one could get funding for it. Um, they started policing papers to make sure uh, nothing was negative about homosexuality. And so you, you, the, the research just drops off the planet. New research started to replace it um, to emphasize how healthy homosexuality was and how important it was to be part of our society in an equitable way. Um, in 87, they said, you know what? Uh, even if you're gay and you don't want to be gay, we don't care. You have to be gay. 
You have to affirm. And if you don't, something's wrong with you. So this was kind of a, a big change, right? They, they went kind of in the middle, and then, the, and then they went over, right? And, and this is how it is today. It's called ego dystonic homosexuality. That was the fancy name for unwanted homosexuality, but they, they kind of threw that out. So there's no such thing as that. And there's a publication of the overhauling of straight America in 1987. Uh, this is an important work from a couple of guys from Harvard, or, uh, a neuroscientist and a marketing guy from Harvard that said, you know what, we have to put a plan together to make America accept gay people. So they put a plan together. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. It was a brilliant plan, and, 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 and it worked quite well. So that's the 80s. Again, a, a really uh, a summary, a, 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 a very poor summary. The Defense of Marriage Act happened in 1996 because legislation was starting to look around themselves and say, something's changing here in our society. Let's protect marriage. Let's allow states to say, we're not okay with gay marriage. Uh, Will and Grace, The Ellen Show, the, you know, we, we, we laughed, we cried, we sympathized. It started becoming part of our culture. And then Matthew Shepard was murdered, and we got angry. Uh, Bill Clinton recognized June as the Gay and Lesbian Pride Month in 99. So then in the 2000s, Robert Spitzer, he was actually the one that was responsible for depathologizing homosexuality in the 70s. And nearly 30 years later, he said, you know what, I'm going to do a little more research here. He uh, published an enormous amount of data that said, you know, it turns out a lot of people that were gay became straight. And I'm fascinated by this, and so I documented all of this, and it turns out perhaps some sexuality is fluid. It can change. And uh, it nearly destroyed him, his career when he published this. And in fact, 10 years later, right before he died, he was cornered by gay activists. Uh, you can, it's actually the videos online. They went to his home, and, and he renounced it and apologized. It's a very strange episode in sociological research. Brokeback Mountain wins multiple Academy Awards in 2005. Proposition 8, we all know about that. It passed in 2008 and then was repealed. Don't Ask, Don't Tell is repealed. In 2010, to present, the Supreme Court ruled gay marriage is legal throughout the US. RuPaul's Drag Race won 14 Primetime Emmy Awards. Laverne Cox, Caitlyn Jenner, and Elliot Page came out as transgender. And the Respect for Marriage Act was passed in 2022, and the, uh, the church was involved in that. I actually got some calls from friends of mine that were very upset that the church supported that. I think the church realized the war was lost, and, and they wanted to secure some religious rights. But inter interesting, fascinating history. It's, uh, this doesn't do justice, but... And this is where we are today. The vast majority of, Mar uh, of America um, has a very positive uh, view of the LGBT movement, um, at least in polite society. Okay, so what good came out of this movement? There's some good. Social awareness and support. I think it's good to know that sexual minorities exist. I think it's a really positive thing. Tolerance and acceptance is part of that awareness. Legal reforms, uh, I, I, I think it's, it's not okay to discriminate based on someone how uh, someone feels about something. Uh, the church got behind this years ago, discrimination, legal discrimination uh, over sec being a sexual minority. Healthcare improvements. Uh, healthcare was, I think, relatively barbaric uh, um, you know, 50 years ago uh, for sexual minorities. It's complicated now but they, at least there's health care. Um, accommodations uh, of new family structures. I think this is a good thing. Our families are different now, very different now in the 21st century. Um, suicide care and prevention. I think this is super important, um, recognizing the, the dangers of suicide for sexual minorities and proactively caring. These are all super positive things. There are some negatives, though. Gender and sexual confusion and anxiety uh, it's, it's real, and it's very challenging. It's hard to do the things on the left without having a, a cost associated with it. 
Influence of social dynamics in LGBTQ identification. It's very difficult. Once you become aware of something, you start thinking, well, is that me? Am I that? And that can lead to anxiety and confusion. And that's, I don't know how to do the one without the other, but that's a negative. Inappropriate educational content. This is very difficult. At what age do you start teaching children about sexual minorities? I don't know the answer, but a lot of people argue about this. And th th this, this argument, this contention, and uh, some legislation that's happened, you can, I think most reasonable people can say, you know what, that might be too far. That's a negative. Legal reforms, some legal reforms I think are, have been unhelpful, right? Uh, healthcare risks. There's healthcare, but then there's also maybe some things that we shouldn't be doing in the name of healthcare. Um, it's very controversial with minors as well, especially around the trans transgender issue. A deconstruction of traditional family structures. This is challenging. On the one hand, I think welcoming lots of different types of families is beautiful. On the other hand, normalizing structures that aren't ideal, there's a cost associated with that. I think the whole like nature where you got mom, dad, and the kids, like that's worked pretty well. And I think that's a good thing. It, it might not be realistic in the 21st century and we need to be okay with that. And the Werther effect. So if you're familiar with the Werther effect, it's uh, when someone famous or popular kills themselves, suicides always go up. People that are sexual minorities, a lot of them are told, you might kill yourself. If you don't, if, if, if you, we don't keep you safe and protected, you might kill yourself. And, and when you tell that to a group over and over again, guess what? People kill themselves because that, that, they, they, they think that's an expectation. This is a very, very hard problem. How do you protect and educate about suicide but not create a Werther effect? Very difficult problem. All of these are hard problems and hard trade-offs. But I thought it was important to recognize that there's good and there's not so good related to this movement. Uh, and of course, this is, this is kind of our new reality here. Uh, about 20% of Gen Z identifies as LGBTQ. Now this is from a couple of years ago. Mo most of the, the, uh, the Gen X and the boomers and the silent generation, it's always been around two or 3%, as far back as we've measured. And in fact, uh, the most recent is now it's 30% of Gen Z. So one in three, of Gen Z, these are younger 20-year-olds, are identifying as LGBTQ. That's strange. That is not something that we've seen ever, ever. How does the church fit in? Well, <laughs> the church is a heteronormative theology, right? Who are we kidding? That's exactly what it is. And what does heteronormative mean? It just means, hey, two genders, mom, dad, kids, Heteronormative sex, I, everything else is just doesn't really fit in well. That's, that's how the church fits in. And so there's some square peg and round hold situation going on here. It's hard. This, <laughs> this is why we're here. This is why we're talking about this. Uh, okay, so um, I'm just going to share the options because I just want to cut to the chase. Okay? Uh, you can believe queerness is intrinsic, innate, and immutable, the essence of identity and being, part of the eternal spirit. So that is one option. Option two is you believe queerness is a thorn in the flesh, temporary mortal condition, and not part of the eternal spirit. We'll talk about this a lot in the remaining time I have, but these are the core options, okay? How do we make sense of gender and sexuality? How, let's, let's talk about epistemology. If we think back to the first lecture, objective reality and us, and what's between us? A filter, right? And that filter is made up of sensory and cognitive and emotional, chemical, genetic, and we have a spirit as well. And that reality has to go through all that filter. And there's a lot of screwed up stuff in our filters. All our, none of our filters are clear. I hope that's not news to any of you. <laughs> uh, now, here's the thing, though. 
If we're asking, am I gay, am I transgender, am I asexual? That goes through our filter, right? Well, our filter is imperfect, right? And this is pretty high stakes. If your filter's not quite right, I, what happens if you make a bad call on this? So we separate our filter a little bit, right? Part of our filter is premortal. It's our spirit. We had that eternity going backwards. Mort mortality, that part of our filter, that just showed up when we were born, OK? Question, is my spirit gay? Is it transgender? Is it asexual? Is it a sexual minority spirit? Or is, is my mortality, my, my filter, my body, my being transgender or asexual? Uh, so I'm going to talk about option one for a minute, OK? And option one, basically, you have a couple sub-options here. The Latter-day Saint concept of God is cruel and unfair, and I cannot subscribe to this idea. So if you believe your spirit is a sexual minority and it's not compatible with the church, then you're like, well, it's, I'm not compatible with the Mormon God. So I'm going to live in cognitive dissonance. I'm going to keep going to church and believing, I guess, but I, somewhere in my head I'm like, this God's unfair, this church is unfair, because how, if you have an eternally gay spirit, how does any of this make sense? And so you, this is kind of a miserable place to be. But a lot of people do it. They're like, I still believe in this church, but I just have this conflict that I can't make sense of. Option B, leave the church. These are rational decisions. Option B here, right? God is merciful and just loves us. There must be an eternal plan to accommodate the eternal nature of this way of being. So maybe like black saints and the priesthood and temple restrictions, God will change the current policies about LGBTQ members. Perfectly rational option here. Or maybe the current policies may not change, but because queerness is inherent eternally in, in the eternities, it'll get worked out. Okay, so if you are option one, these are kind of your options here. Richard Osler is an example of someone who supports option one. Good, Christian, loving man. He's an option one guy. He said, you know, maybe Bruce R. McConkie in 78, when he talked about black saints in the, the priesthood, he said, forget everything that I've said. Maybe that'll happen for sexual minorities in the church. OK? Uh, Taylor Petrie, he wrote Tabernacles of, uh, of Clay and, and uh, wrote an essay called Toward a Post-Heterosexual Mormon Theology. He's the editor of Dialogue. Um, he's a historian, but I, I think it's fair. He's a, he's a queer theorist. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to read this whole quote, but basically he challenges the paradigm of an e eternal or, 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 or of, of a mortal queerness and really says, you know, maybe this is an eternal situation. Uh, Post-structuralist queer approaches is kind of what he uses. Postmodernism, a lot of utility in that on this subject. Uh, Blair Osler uh, wrote a book called Queer Mormon Theology. It's very popular. She says, the most beautiful and queerest of creations is Godhood, a future of our own making through a queer Christ. The world is changing. Humanity is evolving. The question is, how do we want to evolve? God isn't going to stop us. What kind of God do you want to be? Option one. OK. Now, option two. You believe it's a thorn in the flesh, a temporary condition. That's this, where you're like, you know what? I think my spirit's OK. I think mortality is a little screwed up. Right? So what, what, do you, what do you do with that? Well, we must endure our trial by fire for a season and trust in our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a little more simple. OK. Now, uh, a lot of science on this topic we're going to cover today. The science, you know how last time, well, maybe the last couple times I said, here's some options. I, you know, the church, we don't know. Pick the option you like. I'm going to be prescriptive. 
I have to be prescriptive because the data supports one option. It supports option two, okay? If you are an option one person, that's okay. That's a tough row to hoe. Option two is supported by the science and by the theology, and we'll walk through this a little bit, okay? I don't want you to be upset if you're an option one person. I want you to have an open mind, all right? And I'm just sharing what I believe based on the data I have. And I'd hope you'd expect me to do that and not just throw sugar at you, okay? So what does the science say? Sexual orientation is not necessarily static for many people. Gender and sexual identity is subject to influence and change for many people. And sexual attraction is subject to environmental and early development factors for many people. That's what the science says, and we'll look at some scientific research based on this. Now, they don't believe in God, they don't believe in spirit, but they study physiology and psychology and biology, and they say, you know, this is not as simple as you might think. And of course, the church is all on board with option two. Think about 6,000 years of history. Now, this, this is a thought exercise. This is not science. This is just me kind of thinking. This is how I think about it. I think, look at all these civilizations, millions and millions of cultures and languages and peoples and geography over 6,000 years of recorded history. See that little red, red dot there? That's us. That's our civilization. Now, in my mind, I think which is more likely? Our current generation, the little red guy, is the first out of thousands of diverse cultures, geographies, and peoples to open, to be open and enlightened enough to allow the natural occurrence of 30% of humans to finally express their true sexuality and gender. Okay, maybe, you know, maybe we're, we finally figured it out and everyone else got it wrong. Or maybe something weird is happening. Now, by the way, I'm not suggesting because we've, we've had people that were sexual minorities for all 6,000 years. I'm not saying they didn't exist. It just wasn't a third of the population. Maybe, maybe that means something strange is going on, okay? So, we live in a time of peak pornography. I'm not saying pornography is the reason. I'm just sharing that we're in a unique situation, right? We're living in a time of peak cognitive distortions. I covered this uh, a couple lectures ago. We're living in a time of peak deaths of despair. That goes back to 1920. Wow, people are dying. Peak infertility. This is a French study. Sperm count's gone down by a third in their research. What the heck is going on? Peak gender dysphoria. Uh, back in 87, the DSM said, you know, I think there's a thing called gender dysphoria, and, and now it's, it, the literature's full of it. Peak transgender patients. This is 2000. This is the Fenway Health uh, Center in Boston. This is Australia, 2014. This is in Britain. Strange. Strange. Peak autism rate, right? This goes back to 1970. It correlates it with plastic composites, uh, something called a glyphosate. I, maybe it's a fertilizer or, or uh, something that kills bugs. I don't know. I, you know, I'm not saying that there's a relationship. You put two any, any two lines together and make it look like they're correlated. But the reason I bring this up is because autism's going up. And in one study in Australia, they found transgender people are four times more likely to have ADHD and seven times more likely to have autism than the general population. There's, there is a scientific relationship, and they're not the only people who have done this, between being transgender and, autis, uh, and being autistic or being on that spectrum. We don't understand it, but this is, again, something strange happening that we don't understand that's never happened before. Okay, that's the weird stuff. We're, we're at a peak time in that red little dot. What other peak? <laughs> we're at peak wealth. We're, you know, we're at peak freedom, maybe, peak distraction. I mean, there's a lot of peaks in the 21st century. I think that's a function of mortality. 
I don't think God saved up all the strange spirits and sent them into the 21st century. I mean, maybe he did. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> but I see a pattern here. I'm a pattern guy, you know? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think these are reasonable questions to ask, right? This is Hunter Madsen. He's a gay activist from Harvard, OK? He said sexual orientation for, the most, for most humans seems to be the product of a complex interaction between innate predispositions and environmental factors during childhood and early adolescence. So his partner, the neuropsychologist, and, and him, this is in late 80s, and they're like, look, we know, at least in the context of being gay, it's complicated, okay? It is complicated. But uh, let's talk about the science, okay? Sexual orientation is not necessarily static for people. This is a study that was done in 2016 from the University of Utah from Lisa Diamond. She's not a member of the church. In fact, she's a lesbian. Not that that should be important, but that matters to some people. She did an analysis of tens of thousands of people across many different surveys and found that the major conclusion that we can draw from these studies is that change in patterns of same sex and other sex attraction is a relatively common experience among sexual minorities. 25 to 75 percent of sexual minorities change their sexual orientation at least once in their lifetime. I, I know that seems radically different than the common narrative. There's a lot of scientific data to support this. We're not cookie cutters. We're, not, we're complicated beings. And people change over time. Cornell University did a similar, sim, similar study a few years earlier, not quite as extensive, but it was a six-year cohort of 12,000 young adults, and found huge shifts in sexuality. Hey, where do you fit on the Kinsey scale? Six years later, where are you now? Huh, you, you moved. Why? Well, that's a big question. They don't, they don't address that. But people change. So that kind of makes me think, well, wait, if it's a spirit, why are people changing? I don't know. I think that's a reasonable question. The American Psychoanalytic Association, this is in the 90s. They could do research like this in the 90s. They can't really do it anymore. But they went to 285 therapists representing 1,200 homosexual patients. 98% of the therapists said, gay people can't change, and we shouldn't try to make them change. They asked that in the survey. This is the association to their own people. They look, they're, we're not about that. However, 23% of these patients became heterosexual somehow through therapy. We had nothing to do with it because we don't believe in this, but that's how the survey resulted. And again, there's lots more data like this. Again, counterintuitive to the narrative. And I'm not suggesting if you're gay, don't worry, you can change. I am not saying that. I'm saying the data indicates that sexual minorities, a significant number of them, change for any number of reasons that are generally poorly understood. But again, what I'm saying here is maybe this is not innate and permanent and fixed. Oh, the advocate, even they in 2014 said the increasing body of social science research posits that a sizable number of people experience some degree of fluidity in their sexual and romantic attractions, being drawn to the same gender at one point in their life and opposite gender at another. Now, they're not scientists. They're gay advocates. But they're like, yeah, you know, in 2014, we can afford to say this. Don't take this the wrong way, but this is, this is one of the most fascinating studies I'm aware of. This is the University of North Dakota. You know how we're plastic, our brains are a little plastic, we can be conditioned? They decided, what if we took a jar of pennies and tried to make guys sexually attracted to it? Well, they did. They hooked up plethysmographs to their penises and through behaviorist uh, experiments, train their brains to be sexually attracted to a jar of pennies. I know it sounds stupid, but man, humans are suckers. We, you can kind of get us to do anything, especially men. Okay. All right. Gender and sexuality is, sub, uh, is, is influenced. 
This is a prison study, right? Lots of prison studies. Basically, they found, hey, are you straight, prisoners? Did you have sex in prison? When you came out of prison, were you still straight or gay? They said, oh, we're gay. We had sex. Now we decided we're gay, we're gay. All that says is identity changes based on what you do. Not surprising, a straight guy has gay sex after some number of years in prison. Ah, I guess I'm gay. Is he really gay? I don't know. That's a you know, true Scotsman problem. But it changes how people think. Now, do words do the same thing? This is the University of Sydney. They took 460 heterosexuals. They said, hey, we're going to give you books on the fluidity of queerness. We're going to give you books on the innate nature of two genders and a heteronormative literature. We're going to give you those two options. Or we're going to teach you about trees. That's the control group. <laughs> then they took a survey. Not surprising, the people that looked at the queer literature said, I changed my mind. Maybe I'm not straight. They can repeat this study over and over and over again. Humans are so easily influenced. We just are. And that's a good thing, I think. Sometimes it can cause us a lot of anxiety, though. In 2014, Glad and Facebook teamed up, and they created 58 new genders for Facebook that you could choose. We live in strange times. Sexual attraction is subject to environmental and early development factors. 7% of heterosexual men report being molested as children. 7%. That's a tragedy. But 40%, 46% of homosexual men report being molested by children. Now, this is a small study. There are other studies like this. Okay? You're not really allowed to do these studies anymore. These were done in the 80s and 90s when it was okay to study this stuff. Again, I am not saying gay people are gay because they were molested. I am not saying that. What I'm saying is there's a, a correlation between adolescent sexual experiences and adult identification. And it's significant for many people. Okay? Let's not ignore the science. I don't want to explain it. I, I don't know if I can. But there's a correlation here. Humans are complicated, all right? This doesn't apply to all people, but it applies, applies to a lot of people, all right? Some studies indicate the children of LGBT parents are four times more likely to be LGBT. I, that's not a DNA thing. Think about that one. Uh, well, um, it's actually more complicated than that, isn't it? But influence, we're, we're influenced, we're influenced. Okay. Uh, why do we say LGBT people were born that way? Well, there was a campaign, right? A blueprint for transforming social values in straight America. Gay should be considered to have been born that way, even though they're complicated. Remember that quote before? If we want to get legislation done, say they're born that way. And they can't do anything about it. They're just like, it's just like a racial thing. Or the colors of your eyes. Or the color of your hair. And we'll get legislation passed. And they did, and it worked. And that's a reasonable, logical thing to do. Lady Gaga kicked in at the peak. Remember that, baby? You were born that way. Big hit, hit song. She wasn't very subtle. You read the lyrics, it's like, yeah, we get it, we get it, we get it. Many LGBTQ people are effectively born that way, uh, though some aren't. Many are consciously, aren't consciously aware of how they came to feel the way they do. There is no scientific consensus on the cause. There's no gay gene. We've sequenced it. There's, there's nothing there. But there are epigenetic theories that are interesting. Fetal endocrinology, epigenetic markers, something going on in the womb, maybe. Right? And that's effectively born that way. Does that have anything to do with the spirit? I, I mean, I don't think so. By organization, the, the American Institute of Bisexuality said, Look, the born this way approach to sexual identity is losing its popularity among queer folks. They know that this was sort of a charade. And it's okay. You know, they're like, yeah, okay, let's get back to the science. We're complicated. So, you can believe queerness is intrinsic, innate, immutable, the essence of identity, and being part of this eternal spirit. That is an easy thing to believe. Now, theologically, it's 
really complicated. <laughs> I don't really know how to explain it theologically. The queer theorists that are Latter-day Saints, that are sincere and good people, they can try. The science doesn't go along with this. Or maybe queerness is a thorn in the flesh, a temporary mortal condition. What if you say, hey, I've got a grandson or a granddaughter or a spouse that's like, man, this is deep in my bones, I feel this way. <laughs> man, my mortal mantle that I have on makes me feel deep in the bones about everything. It's powerful. It's, it is overwhelmingly powerful. I don't know the difference between my eternal spirit and me. I don't know the difference. I know intellectually there is. But man, I can't put my finger on it. That's, I, don't, I think if it was any other way, mortality wouldn't work as a test. Let's go through some questions. We might have to go a little over, by the way, right? <laughs> President McConkie has some brilliant stuff to share. We'll take a few minutes, we'll go through some questions. Is it possible that a female spirit was placed into a male body? I don't know. Possibly, I, I don't know. It's a totally fair question. Genetically speaking, there's a tiny percentage of us that are maybe a little screwed up. And does the spirit maneuver through that? I, I, you know, I don't know, man, fair question. Are transgender children born that way? We can look at the science here. There's been lots of studies on this where they study children and then 20 years later they come back and say, how you doing? Well, and they found that 60 to 90% of the transgender children as adults are like, yeah, I'm not transgender anymore. Now, most of them said, I'm gay, <laughs> but they're not transgender, okay? Lots of studies. Now. Some of you might be like, well, wait a second. Uh, I, I saw this headline, new study shows trans youth are extremely unlikely to detransition. This just came out last year. Or no, 80% of trans youth do not transition. Or the New York Times, few transgender children change their minds after five years, study finds. These are real headlines. We're gonna do a little epistemological detective work together today, okay? Remember the iceberg, okay? That's these headlines. You read these headlines, you're like, well, guess what I learned? Okay, let's go a little bit deeper. We'll look at books made of paper and academic research. All these, all these articles cite the American Academy of Pediatrics paper. They say according to this paper. So let's read the paper. What does the paper say? Well, and we're not gonna do the experiments ourselves, so we can skip the bottom of, that would be fascinating, right? Who has time for that? Well, we don't. But we're willing to read the paper, and the paper says, hey, we recruited 317 kids. The average age was eight years old. So they took a bunch of eight-year-olds. Five years later, these are transgender eight-year-olds. Five years later, they checked, and 94% of these 13-year-olds are like, yep, I'm still transgender. Well, okay, fine. I don't know there's a whole lot of difference between an eight-year-old and a 13-year-old, frankly. I mean, you know, I've, I've taught primary before. And let me tell you, when they get into young men's, that first level, they're, they're, they're just basically like the primary kids. Now, so young transgender children tend to continue to identify as transgender older children. That's probably true. I can accept that. That seems reasonable, you know? These other studies, though, transgender children tend to desist identifying as transgender adults. These are not mutually exclusive. These are probably both true. But that's really different with those headlines we're trying to say. I didn't write the science. I'm just telling you what the news says. Fascinating stuff to read. Very controversial. Man, you want to get in a fight with someone? Just cite either one of these on Facebook. OK. Do LGBT people have a high rate of suicide? Probably. Now, why don't I say emphatically yes? Frankly, because the CDC doesn't track sexual orientation of suicide victims. They just don't. We don't have data. But they have tracked the suicide ideation of students in very broad uh, 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 survey work, very broad survey all across America, and it's significantly higher in sexual minorities. It, 
So yes, they probably commit suicide significantly more. Is their suicidality higher because they're discriminated against? Well, now this is a really interesting question. The answer is possibly to some degree. Why the hesitation? One, it's really hard to test. And two, there are other major factors. One is Sweden. You see that? Sweden, you're welcome. Two guys kissing. Visit Sweden. Sweden is one of the most openly accepting places for sexual minorities in the world. It has been for decades. It turns out if you're married and you're gay in Sweden, your suicide rate is still three times higher than everyone else. What's going on? Completely accepted, celebrated. What's going on? We don't know. Here's some ideas that social scientists have, suge have suggested. Well, lesbian, gays, and bisexuals, their drug use is twice as high as straight people. Now you can say, well, it's because of this or that. I, I don't, you know, this is the data. And drug use is highly correlated with suicide. Mental illness is three times higher. Why? That's a whole nother question. But it's highly correlated with suicide. Is the suicide rate high in Utah? Because we want to talk about Mormons, don't we? Yes. Yes, it is. We have an elevation problem. This is well understood, well, I should say well understood, is well known among social scientists. See on the left there, the dark part of that map is where suicides disproportionately happen. And on that map up there on the right, that's the elevation. They think there's something going on with the lack of oxygen, serotonin production, they, they don't truly understand it. Now, and, and, and they've, they've controlled for age, young people kill themselves more. They've controlled for gun availability. Well, those hicks out in the middle know where they got guns and they kill themselves. They controlled for all of that. Something else is going on here. So yeah, Utah has a higher suicide rate. But does the policies of the church increase LGBTQ suicide? Yeah, we really want to know. We're going to keep digging. Well, possibly. But the current data says uh, probably not. This is really fascinating. Tens of thousands of Utah students the Utah Department of Health said, hey, we want to find out what's going on with our students in Utah. Well, have you considered suicide? If you're a Latter-day Saint student, you have half the rate of suicide consideration. Have you attempted it? Less than half the rate. This is compared with people that have no religion. This is not some squirrely little study. It's the U.S. Department of Health, or Utah Department of Health. If you're a Latter-day Saint and you're a sexual minority, you are much better off. You are much safer in the church. Why? Gosh, I don't know. Do you have a couple more hours? <laughs> but the data is that this is a good place for people. Notice the religions, other religions, Protestants and Catholics, it's a little better. But man, it's amazing if you're a Latter-day Saint. How about that? Now, you don't see this in the Salt Lake Tribune. I don't want to pick on them or anything. <laughs> but this is really important data, really important data. Now, does this fix everything? Does it answer all the questions about suicide and, and the church? No, 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 not at all. But it's important data to understand. What options do gay and queer Latter-day Saints have? Well, there's four options. There's only four. First one is stay single and celibate. Or stay single and non-celibate. Or engage in an LGB relationship. Or engage in a mixed orientation relationship. That's where if I'm a gay guy, and maybe I marry a straight woman. That's what that means, mixed orientation, marriages, or relationships. Now, the church is like, yeah, we're OK with this. We're not OK with that. We're not OK with that. And we're OK with this. OK? Them's the facts. Well. Aren't these options terrible? <sighs> this is interesting. Four option survey, uh, a handful of PhDs and therapists in Utah said, you know what, we're going to find out about this. So they did a convenient survey. So take that with a grain of salt. But they found several thousand people that are sexual minorities. Half of them were Latter-day Saints. They said, what options are you choosing and how do you feel? Well, 
single and celibate, 42% were like, yeah, I'm happy. 46 are like, yeah, I don't like this. And then 12 are like, yeah, you know, it's okay. Single and not celibate, uh, you know, there's happiness, there's some unhappiness. They're kind of strangely similar. That's weird, huh? Same-sex relationships, they're like, you know, I'm pretty dang happy. Mixed orientation, pretty happy, but there's some sadness. Now, we don't know a lot about why this is, but I'll tell you something that's interesting. Married people that have children always score lower on happiness. <laughs> I, it's a fact. It's a sociological fact. And mixed orientation relationships more often have children. Is that the sole reason there's a difference? I, I don't know. But 81%, I mean, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good run, OK? So this is the data we have on this, right? There's some bad data out there about, oh, divorce rates are 70%. That's crap. I would, I, I'd love to share more information about that, but there's a lot of <laughs> this, this whole lecture, there's so much bad information out there, it's rough. But anyway, OK. Just so you know, marriage should not be viewed as a therapeutic step to solve problems such as homosexual inclinations and practices. That, but back in 1987, Gordon B. Hinckley said that. So that's a caveat. I'm gay. I better go get married to a straight girl. That'll fix me. That is not what you should be thinking at all. Bad idea. But if you're gay and you meet a girl who's straight and she becomes your best friend and you love her, Give it a shot. I love being married to my best friend. You know? Mixed orientation marriages, they have sex too. And a lot of them report that it's okay. All marriages are complicated. Okay. Did BYU electrocute gay people in the 1970s? <laughs> I know some of you were wondering about this. No, but sort of yes. OK, Harvard started doing this, the University of Milwaukee, the University of Pittsburgh. It's called behaviorist aversion therapy. It was actually started in the 1940s in uh, the Northwest. Man, they cured thousands of alcoholics using shock therapy. Aversion therapy has a long history of efficacy. Now, this is, this is 50 to 20 milliamps. You guys ever used, like, a, you go to physical therapy? and they make your muscle twitch, and you sit there for 20 minutes, and they say, okay, you, your, your leg's better now. Or That's all it is. How do I know? I've done it. I bought a virgin therapy machines and did it on myself. Now, it doesn't feel good, okay? It hurts. But it's not an electrocution, okay? Now, interestingly enough, Harvard did 20 milliamps because in their research paper they said, we wanted to hurt the patient. BYU used five, and they allowed the patient to change it to whatever they wanted. Still not comfortable, okay, but it's, it's, not, it's not like uh, Jack Nicholson, you know, the Cuckoo Nest movie. <laughs> Moderate success reported. Harvard had a follow-up two years later. They're like, yeah, some of our subjects got married to women. We don't know anything more about that. Uh, after 1974, everything died. Everything stopped. No more. You're not allowed to do this research anymore. BYU squeaked in. In 1975, they're like, ah, oh, we just want to try one more thing. Because this 74 change took another year to get ratified, and then, you know, it's it complicated. They said, hey, we want to do the Harvard experiment. We want to use lower voltage. We want to try it without pornography, because the way it works, right, they show you pornography, and if it's the wrong kind, they go, Eat, and you go, ah. And then if they keep doing that, it's like Pavlov's dog. And after a while, you're like, nah, I don't really like that stuff anymore. <laughs> really simple on paper, OK? They said, can we put clothes on the women and clothes on the men and try this? That's really, honestly, all they wanted to try at BYU. Very BYU thing to do, isn't it? 14 people participated. Anyway, that's, 
Why is that funny? I, <laughs> they're volunteers. I, anyway, uh, so look, I, I mean, just to be serious, this was very traumatic for a lot of people, this whole concept of convergent therapy. In the research end, it was, I think, all above board. All the data shows it was above board. There were a lot of private practices that, frankly, were probably kind of messed up. They were not academics, uh, up to academic standards. They weren't controlled. They weren't doing research. And there's a lot of quacks out there in private practice. A lot of them were affiliated with BYU. And probably some bad stuff happened, you know? So there's your answer about BYU. Did the church teach that masturbation cause homosexuality? Well, no, but Spencer W. Kimball sort of did. But he sort of didn't. Cut him some slack. He said, what is more, masturbation too often leads to grievous sin, even to sin that against nature, homosexuality. So he said, it leads to this, but what he was talking about is if it's done in private, oftentimes it evolved into mutual masturbation. Those are two guys that are masturbating each other and then into total homosexuality. So that was the context that he made this statement. It's taken out of context, and people just are really mean, especially to be Kimball. But this is where this myth, if you heard this myth, comes from. Uh, what is the current policy on LGBT people? Well, they can be baptized, and they can participate in the church. They may be baptized if they're transgender, and they currently aren't going through a medical transition. Transgender people that have already gone through a medical transition can be baptized with first presidency approval. Priesthood ordinances are based off assigned at birth sex. Okay, this is like, hey, can I be ordained? Same-sex marriage may incur disciplinary actions. May. Medical transition may incur disciplinary action. Non-transitioned, socially or medically, may receive a temple recommend. But as soon as you socially or medically transition, no temple recommend. Okay, all this is in the handbook. But this stuff gets updated pretty, pretty re frequently. If I put up five years ago, it'd be a little different. Quick, resources, and then we're done. Sorry, it's just a lot. there's just so much, there's so much. Uh, if you're interested in resources, these are resources that I recommend. They're not perfectly aligned with the church, but they're pretty close. GenSpec is a secular organization. It's not a church one, but it's, it's, it's got good stuff, okay? So these are folks I, I recommend, with that little asterisk of, hey, none of these are official church things, but this is good stuff. I would proceed with caution and maybe take a bag of salt or maybe just skip these guys altogether. I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm just saying the content here conflicts often with the church theology, can cause some confusion and uh, it, it's, it's a tough row, okay? Again, not bad people, sincere people, just not really lined up well and might cause a lot of heartache because of that for you. These folks you should just skip, okay? I strongly advise not subscribing to these folks. I'm not saying they're bad people either. I'd also advise you that a lot of these folks Use church quotes from prophets and apostles and scripture, and they're very interested in having Latter-day Saints subscribe to their way of thinking. Most of these organizations are run by former members of the church, um, and it's, it's just, it, yeah, just avoid them. That's my recommendation, my personal recommendation. Keep calm and follow the prophet. Now it's time for President McConkie. Sorry. <laughs> That's, That's all right. Stand up, stretch. I told you we might go a little late here. <laughs> should we say should we say like quarter quarter till? Yeah. We'll just just expect to be in your seat till quarter till, okay? If you gotta pop out, that's okay. Um a lot to cover. Um I want to say a few things, maybe disclaimers from the, from the top. Um, first of all, what I'm going to talk about, I am not the originator of. I, I am not presenting my opinion whatsoever. Uh, I also feel a responsibility as a stake president in this area to 
not give my opinion, but to represent in this portion the ideas presented by the church. Uh, that means the prophet, the apostles, and what we find in the scriptures. Uh, so I am not a purveyor, I'm not an originator of these ideas tonight, I'm simply a messenger. Um, and I also appreciate, you know, as Josh and I were putting together what classes we ought to teach, this is the one, frankly, I was the most nervous about, because it's so difficult and so modern and so with us right now. There's not a person in this room who doesn't have a brother, sister, cousin, niece, grandson, friend who has same-sex attraction, uh, who's gay, and, all, and we love them, and we feel for them, and we want to lift and encourage and support them, right? And that changes it. We're not talking about polygamy uh, in the same sense, you know, that it's current and with us. Uh, and so, anyway, um, there's a little bit of a burden, uh, and, and frankly, in terms of doctrine and scriptural doctrine and prophetic doctrine, there is no LGBT doctrine. It's what Josh was saying about, hey, this, you know, 3,000 years ago, there was no, that this was not a topic of scriptural discourse. Um, so we couch this in terms like the doctrine of creation, procreation, gender, sexuality, and marriage. Back to the idea of the burden of communicating these ideas, President Nelson says, sometimes we as leaders of the church are criticized for holding firm to the laws of God, defending the Savior's doctrine and resisting the social pressures of our day. But our commission as ordained apostles is to go into the, all the world and preach his gospel to every creature. We're commanded to teach truth. In so doing, sometimes we are accused of being a little uncaring as we teach Father's requirements for exaltation in the celestial kingdom. But wouldn't it be far more uncaring for us not to tell the truth, not to teach what God has revealed? It is precisely because we do care deeply about all of God's children that we proclaim His truth. We may not always tell people what they want to hear. Prophets are rarely popular, but we will always tell the truth. Thus our commission as apostles is to teach nothing but truth. That commission does not give us the authority to modify divine law. That's where the prophet's coming from. Now I'm going to do a fair bit of reading tonight um, because like what I said, I don't, I don't care if you have my opinion. I want you to hear what the scriptures and what the prophets and apostles and the leaders of the church are saying. So let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. Thank you, Maria Von Trapp. <laughs> Hope you get that reference. Um, creation and procreation. We know that before the creation uh, in the Edenic or terrestrial state, Eden, that there was a spiritual creation. Spirit, matter, and creation, Joseph Smith says, coexisted and was co-eternal with God. We use different terms for that, intelligences and an and element, right? For I, the Lord, created all things of which I have spoken spiritually before they were naturally upon the face of the earth. Latter-day Saints are very unique in this doctrine. In fact, Abraham, the book of Abraham, is an account of the architecture and the spiritual designing of what would later be clothed in, in, in matter, right? Temporal matter, not spiritual matter. In the beginning, Abraham talks about that seeds are planted, right? And, and out of seeds grow trees. And it would always yield fruit after its own kind. An apple seed would always produce an apple tree. An apple seed could not produce an orange tree. It was commanded, it's inherent in its design, that it produces after its own kind. And my story tonight is all about seed. I mean, I'll, you know, headline, I'm talking about seed. All right? As it was with plants, so it was with the animal kingdom. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and the creeping thing and the beast of the field after his kind, and, and it was so. We do not believe in the doctrine of ex nihilo. 
We do not believe in creation out of nothing, right? Um, we believe that there was a divine blueprint uh, and that the blueprint is the design of what would physically come later. Um, as it was with plants and animals, in the beginning, this is Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, at the very, very beginning. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. I mean, you juxtapose that to Facebook's 58 definitions, the Bible is much more simple. It says, male and female created he them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fr and the first commandment in the entire Bible is about seed and reproduction. The very first commandment in the Bible says, let us multiply and replenish. In 1909, they were dealing with different issues. It was evolution back then, remember? And Joseph F. Smith, who's the president of the church from 1901 to 1918, um, issues... Uh, an official statement from the first presidency. And, um, and it goes to the whole church. He says, Adam, our first progenitor, the first man, was like Christ, a pre-existent spirit. And like Christ, he took upon him the appropriate body, a body of man, and thus became a living soul. I'll skip down. It shows that man, as a spirit, was begotten and born of heavenly parents. First presidency statement. As a spirit was begotten and born of heavenly parents and reared to maturity in the eternal mansions of the Father prior to coming upon the earth in a temporal body. You catch that? Bruce R. McConkie said, we know that Jehovah, Christ, assisted by many of the noble and great ones, of whom Michael is but the illustration, did in fact create the earth and all forms of plants and animal life on the face of the earth. But when it came to placing man on the earth, there was a change in creators. That is, the Father himself became personally involved. All things were created by the Son, using the power delegated by the Father, except man. In the Spirit, and again in the flesh... Man was created by the Father. There was no delegation of authority where the crowning creature of creation was concerned. You listen carefully in the temple and you'll get that same idea. This was not delegated. It could not have been delegated. Creation by the word meant to organize. Joseph Smith talks about how creation meant to organize the elements. Um, and, and, and we know that others were involved in the creation, right? You go look at Abraham 3, the Council of the Gods. You have statements like from Orson Pratt, who says that, um, that there was a grand council in heaven and that God, as the president of that council, conducted the organizing powers that brought forth the earth. Joseph Smith also says that El Adam holds the keys of creation. So Adam can do things to help create and organize, and so can the noble and great. But when it comes to creating man, the father is directly responsible. He cannot, will not delegate that privilege. The father of Jesus, this also comes from Joseph F. Smith in 1909. The father of Jesus is our father also. Jesus, however, is the first born among all the sons of God, the first begotten in the spirit, and the only begotten in the flesh. That idea gets us in trouble with our Protestant friends. He is our elder brother, and we, like him, are in the image of God. Then President Smith says, all men and women are in the similitude of the universal father and mother. First presidency statement, 1909, and are literally, not figuratively, not metaphorically, are literally the sons and daughters of a universal father and mother. I, I, I picked this image because the, um, the New Testament talks about the apostles who see Christ walking on the water, and they, they think that they see a spirit. You see, they recognize that a spirit looked like the body. Section 77 supports that idea. That which is spiritual is in the likeness of that which is temporal. 
And that which is temporal is in the likeness of that which is spiritual. If your spirit were to step out of your body, it would look like you. Might be a younger version, but it would look like you. Joseph F. Smith, one more time. I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know that God is a being with body parts and passions, and that his Son is in his own likeness, and that man is created in the image of God. The Son, Jesus Christ, grew and developed into manhood the same as you and I. His Father, uh, as likewise did God, his Father grow and develop to the supreme being that he now is. Man was born of woman. Christ, the Savior, was born of woman. And God, the Father, was born of woman. Adam, our earthly parent, was also born of woman into this world, the same as Jesus, you, and I. We, we have to get the idea out of our head that creation was um, this primordial swamp in the sky of element that we put in a little sugar and spice and everything nice and skirt, spun it around and out came a woman. Uh, it's always been the same, and it's seed after its kind, Right? In fact, the word begotten in Greek means having fathered or brought forth from the womb. Well, wait. I thought Adam was made from dust, and I thought Eve came from his rib. Uh, Brigham Young joked on one occasion, Moses made the Bible to say that Adam's wife was taken out of his side and made, uh, made of one of his ribs. I do not know anything to the contrary of my ribs being equal on both sides. The Lord knows if I lost a rib for each wife, I should have none left a long time ago. <laughs> so, a little Brigham Young humor. Was Adam made from the dust of the earth? Of course not. Of course not. Of course not. And here's your scriptural reference. Inasmuch as you were born in the world by what? You women know better than anybody. By water, by blood, and by spirit and thus became of dust a living soul. That's the metaphor, right? Oh, we ought to just say their names signify their roles. Eve is the mother of all living. Adam means mankind. God's law of marriage, we did a little of this during the Pearl of Marriage discussion. Don't need to spend too much time. The point is that Adam and Eve are married by God in the Garden of Eden. The standing law is one man, one woman. Joseph Fielding Smith uh, effectively says that Adam and Eve were married by God in the Garden of Eden. He married them in a condition that was, that was not ending. Um, it was not a mortal condition, and God the Father performed that marriage. Doctrine and Covenants 131, we know the doctrine. In the celestial glory, there are three heavens or degrees, and in order to obtain the highest, a man must enter into the order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And if he does not, he cannot obtain it. He may enter into the other, but that is the end of his kingdom. He cannot have increase. When we talk about increase, we mean seed. Section 132, again, we're back. What a popular section in this lecture series. These two verses, verses 19 and 20, I think really tell a doctrinal story. We said section 132 starts by showing God is a God of law, a God of contract, a God of order, that when he reveals his will, you are now required to live it. Then he gives three case studies about marriage, and this is the third. Again, verily I say unto you, if a man, a singular man, marry a wife, a singular wife, by my word, which is my law, and by the new and everlasting covenant, and it is sealed in them by the Holy Spirit of promise. And I'll stop there. That's the if statement. Here's the then statement. Then shall they be gods. Because they, who's they? A man, a wife. Because they have no end, and therefore they shall be from everlasting to everlasting. Because they continue, then shall they be above all, because all things are subject unto them. Then shall they be gods, because they have, I skipped something. Nine times in that passage, the pronoun they or them is used. Man and wife together. You can't do it without the other. That's how it works. That's the way God designed it. Um, further in that passage, in section 132, you really get into the idea of Abraham and the seed 
and the Abrahamic covenant and how God's promise was that Abraham and Sarah would have eternal posterity, stars in the heavens, sand on the seashore, right? And then he says that this is the law of my holy priesthood. That's the law. Something about God's law of his holy priesthood has everything to do with the procreative powers ordained and sustained in the eternities, right? Abraham receives these promises concerning his what? His seed. And then verse 31, this promise is yours. He's talking to Joseph Smith. Because you were from Abraham, and I'd say the same thing to each one of you. And the promise was made to Abraham, and by this law, the law of the holy priesthood, verse 28, is the continuation of the works of my Father, wherein he glorifieth himself. God is not expanding in knowledge, he's not expanding in power, he's not extending the realm of his truth. The way God expands and progresses is in the continuation of his seed. And when they are risen up, like the King Paul discourses, he takes a higher position, if you will. Instead of said simply, God loves seeing you and I progress. That's what he's all about. Here's the point. You think about the temple for a moment. You and I are Adam and Eve. Adam is mankind. Eve is the mother of all living. Now you change channels in the temple and you are reminded that you and I are Abraham and Sarah. And we have the same promises of the law of the holy priesthood, which pertains to the seed, as we make and keep those sacred covenants, the way the Lord has ordained them. Many of the adversary's most relentless temptations involve violations of moral purity. The power to create life is the one privilege of Godhood that Heavenly Father allows his mortal children to exercise. Thus, God set clear guidelines for the use of this living divine power. Physical intimacy is only for a man and a woman who are married to each other. Elder Christofferson, we'll refer to him a few times tonight, who's very familiar with this issue, has a gay brother. While we wait upon the Lord, this is the important part, President M. Russell Ballard reminds us that scriptures and Latter-day prophets confirm that everyone who is faithful in keeping gospel covenants will have the opportunity for exaltation. Exaltation includes marriage and children. Now, I went to a regional training a year ago, January, where he taught this exact same thing. We were talking about LGBT issues. Someone asked the question, and he said, I mean every promise. All right, now that says something about orientation, covenant keeping, and what happens in the hereafter, as long as, as long as you keep your covenants, right? Gender. Proclamation is very clear. Sorry, that small print. Each male and female is a beloved son, spirit, or daughter of heavenly parents, and as such has a divine nature. And destiny, gender is an essential characteristic of individual, premortal, mortal, and eternal identity and purpose. So pretty clear. Elder Bednar says that gender in large measure defines who we are. Why we're here upon the earth and what we are to do and become. For divine purposes, male and female spirits are different, distinctive, and complementary, and aren't we grateful for that? The unique combination of spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional capacities of both males and females were needed to implement the plan of happiness. Now, we see this play out in my home. My wife is loving and nurturing, and she would laugh when I'd come, she'd come home, and I'd come home from work. I got a kid uh, holding by one foot, like wrestling him, throwing him around. She doesn't do that. We, we, we are complementary in, in many ways by our own by what our gender affords us. President Oaks, who has really become a target of a lot of derision um, from, from those who are really angry about church positions, um, he says, look, there's three fundamental doctrines. First, that male and female are part of a binary creation that's essential to the plan of salvation. Second, uh, that it's only possible 
this power of procreation through the inherent combination of male and female joined in eternal marriage. Not possible, but that is, that's, that's the Lord's ordained plan. Finally, the long-standing doctrinal statements reaffirmed in the proclamation of the family years ago will not change. He's pretty definitive about that. And I don't know if you caught this in the last general conference in October, but when he was speaking about this same principle, he said that it was, quote, irrevocable doctrine. Um, he sometimes says that policies and clarifications are helpful as they continue to get better, right? Right? Um, for example, the intended meaning of gender in the family proclamation and as used in church statements and publications uh, since that time is biological sex at birth. They're clarifying, uh, but not changing the doctrine. So what? Brothers and sisters, the, the doctrine itself is actually pretty simple and pretty clear. And I don't think anything I've said up here is like a newsflash to anybody. What's hard is the application of the doctrine to those who find themselves not in the heteronormative relationship that they like, you know, that they either want to be or don't want to be in, but want to be affiliated with the church, want to make covenants, want to progress, as the prophet says. What do we do? That's the hard part. This is where the rubber hits the road. All these questions do I belong? Am I sinning because I feel a certain way? Will I have these feelings in the hereafter? Am I my sexuality? Can I be exalted? What causes this? Th these, are the, these are the practical issues that you obviously arise and that we struggle with, right? I think maybe in the words of, of, of somebody who's dealing with this in their own personal life might be helpful. So after dating for some time, we eventually got married. And I was pretty excited about being married and experienced the whole married thing. Um, I actually thought that getting married and all that will cure me. I, unfortunately, it didn't happen. Um, I felt many times that covering up or hiding or not acknowledging my attractions made me feel that I was living in denial. Um, but I always felt really uh, conflicted inside. It didn't affect my love for my wife or my attraction towards her. It was just more about coping with these attractions towards men and hoping that getting married will change it. I don't really think about it in those terms that, oh, I'm LDS and my husband's SSA. Um, he's still my husband. I don't really talk about it. Well, actually, I don't talk about it with anyone at church. But when discussions arise, when they talk about um, gay people or things that have happened this year, I think I feel I have more tender feelings that maybe I wouldn't have had otherwise. <laughs> so I feel like I could sympathize a little bit more knowing my husband and what he goes through and how how things affect him and his feelings. The members that are understanding and non-judgmental, um, that show love and support for people who are gay or experiencing such attraction, that's the best thing they can do is just not to judge. Because I think um, a lot of members that experience SSA already feel bad about those feelings. And Making them feel worse isn't going to help them in any way. And, um, you know, we all go to church, and we all want to show love and charity. And anybody who goes to church usually wants to be there. They want to be uplifted. They want to be inspired to do something better with their lives. And so when there are hurtful comments, um, it's really hard for those members that experience SSA or that are gay. It's really hard for them to feel welcome at church, and we want them to feel welcome. We want them to feel love. And that we can all make it back to Heavenly Father someday. 
I think we need to be very, very careful. We need to be very, very careful that we are compassionate, that we're non-judgmental, that we're welcoming. Um, I, I think we've got to probably learn to be better as Latter-day Saints. And I, and I think we are better maybe than five, ten years ago, and we've got to get more. We've got, we've got to do more, right? But, um, you know, you, you hear that brother and that sister, and all of a sudden, all the theology, all the doctrine, all the science is, is periphery because now you have an individual that you love and that you know and that you feel for, right? And all of us have that. All of us have that uh, in our families and in our circles. Elder Oaks, you are a son or a daughter of God, and our hearts reach out to you in warmth and affection. Notwithstanding your present same gender attractions, you can be happy during this life, lead a morally clean life, perform meaningful service in the church, enjoy full fellowship with your fellow saints, and ultimately receive all the blessings of eternal life. God's love is so great that he requires his children to obey his laws because only through that obedience can they progress and return toward, or, or progress towards the eternal destiny that he desires for them. Thus, in the final judgment, we will be assigned to a kingdom of glory that is commensurate with our obedience to his laws. He taught that in the last general conference. Basically, he's saying here that we don't know all the reasons why. And Josh hit on that scientifically. But um, he does say that they are among the challenges that a person can experience in mortality, which is only a tiny fraction of our eternal existence. Now, that's hard to hear when you're saying, hey, let's put your attractions just on the side, like just for mortality. <laughs> right? That's hard. I get that. That's very hard. And yet... Mortality is a nanosecond. There's a lot. Look, this would, be very, this would be harder if we didn't believe in the three-act play. If we didn't believe in the pre-mortal sphere and the post-mortal sphere. So many of the theological issues that we struggle with, evil and suffering and, I mean, all this sort of thing, it, we depend upon an eternal perspective to resolve our theological concerns. God has, not, has also not changed his law of chastity. Requirements to enter the temple have not changed. And our desire for there to be love at home and harmony between parent and child has not changed. This is in reference to the 1915 policy, if, if you're familiar. Though we of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles cannot change the law of God, we can adjust policy when the Lord directs us to do so. You have recently seen such examples because the restoration is ongoing Policy changes will continue to ch will, will surely continue. We also clarified that homosexual immorality would be treated in the eyes of the church as the, as in the same manner as heterosexual immorality. That's a really important distinction. That the, the 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 issue is this thing we call the law of chastity. The boundary for physical intimacy is a covenant relationship as opposed to love, right? Now, we, we, in the proper context, you would have love in that covenantal relationship. But that's that when we talk about the law of chastity, which, again, is defined in the house of the Lord, that's, that's what we're speaking about. But we're not saying that heterosexual violations of the law of chastity are somehow um, less egregious than, than homosexual transgressions. No, 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 no. The issue is the law. And by the way, all of us, great or in small degrees, have violated that law. And so we are all universally dependent upon the principle of repentance, the atonement of Jesus Christ, His grace and nurturing arm, all of us, right? So it would do us not very well to point a finger and say, well, you're on this end of the spectrum, in this serious, I think we ought to be a little bit more introspective and, and maybe less judgmental because we are not the final judges, right? So we need less of this on the right and more of that. 
And I wasn't picking that because it was colors like the rainbow flag. It's just that <laughs> I, I, I just am trying to say we ought to do some huddling here with all kinds of people and we ought to be inclusive and we ought to be welcoming and we would never want someone who didn't feel like they couldn't be here on Sunday because of their orientation. Bottom line. Bottom line. We welcome all to come worship and partake freely of the heavenly gift. Here's a word of counsel, brothers and sisters. We're almost done. If you think that you can be insensitive and judgmental because you have divine law on your side and therefore not required to love those of the LGBT community, you are in fact breaking the Lord's commandments. If you think that because you are compassionate, open-minded, and tolerant, that you don't have to keep the commandments or encourage others of the LGBT community to do so, you are also breaking the Lord's commandments. Cross-examine yourself. Both of those statements, I believe, are true. There is no change in the church's position on what is morally right. But what is changing and what needs to change is helping church members response, respond sensitively and thoughtfully when they encounter same-sex attraction in their own families, among other church members or elsewhere. That's what we've got to get better at. And I think we are. And we've got room to go. So what do we do, brothers and sisters? We love. We welcome. We listen. We encourage. We embrace. Mosiah 18, we mourn with those who mourn. We stand in comfort of those who need comfort. Right? We welcome, we lift, and we understand God's law, and we honor God's law. We love our neighbor, and we keep his commandments. We do both of those things. It's not always just as easy as it is printed on a PowerPoint slide. But brothers and sisters, I do think that we can go to our knees and ask the Lord to bless us with understanding and with perspective. And we can go to the Lord and we can seek for Him to enlighten our minds and our hearts. And I promise you that He will never ask you to be unfriendly, judgmental, bigoted, or otherwise. And he will also not ever say, son or daughter, you don't have to keep my commandments. He won't do either. He'll say patiently, come, son or daughter, keep working. Extend grace and mercy. Don't give up. Don't you dare give up. Well, I don't feel like everybody else. I don't look and sound like everybody else, and I struggle with different... Well, don't you dare give up. You keep striving. You keep going. Here is my law, and when circumstances outside of your control make it difficult to honor my law, I promise divine and eternal compensation. But don't you dare give up on me, because I haven't given up on you. Well, brothers and sisters, um, let's keep striving, let's keep working, let's keep loving and lifting, and let's honor God, his love, and his law. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.